Todd is with the Indiana DOT. He's been there since 1994, like many of us in various roles. Uh, he, uh, he's mostly in maintenance and operations, and his prior role is the pavement preservation engineer. Um, he helped develop and implement their pavement preservation initiative that started in 2009. Um, as program has grown, uh, in 2016, they used over $40 million and did over 7,000 7, lane miles of preservation work this year, since I'm senior. Uh, and as a 1994 graduate of Rose Holman Institute of Technology, where he received a bachelor's in civil engineering. So uh, y'all welcome Todd Shields. All right, well, kind of interesting going right after lunch, but it's also good, I think, going toward the end of the program. Uh, I know I've learned a lot this week. I always get a lot out of these uh, partnership meetings. And uh, some of the things that I actually had in my presentation, I think I've learned more about this week, which is really good. So before we uh, maybe get going too much here, just kind of curious, uh, I'll pick on the agency folks. If you're an agency folk, uh, raise your hand. Keep your hands up. I want you to keep your hand up if you are familiar with your agency's quality assurance program related to pavement preservation treatments. It's better than I thought. Okay, good. So we're going to talk about here the, uh, the components of a quality assurance program, uh, talk about who is responsible for what, and uh, we'll, we'll dive into quality control plans. Um, I'm going to focus this or frame this around chip seals just because I had to pick something, uh, but kind of the same themes I'm gonna talk about would apply to microsurfacing or any other pavement preservation treatment. So before we dive too deep into the weeds here, the thing that we wanna keep front and center, uh, and I think Dave touched on this, let's, let's keep in mind the goal here. The goal is a quality and product. Uh, if we can end up with that, then we've all done our jobs. Um, so definitions, uh, if anyone's familiar with CFR 637, it's only about two pages, but it's the uh, driving force between all of our quality assurance programs and requirements. Um, for any federal aid project, we're required to comply with that. Most agencies, I think, uh, whether it's state, federal, whatever funding, um, we want to follow those same uh, quality requirements. Uh, I know being a maintenance guy, being a former design guy, we get the mindset that if it's uh, if it's state funds, we can do whatever the heck we want. We don't have to comply with anything. That's really not the best way to do it. So quality assurance. Um, definition as laid out for quality assurance is all those planned and systematic actions necessary to provide confidence that a product or service will satisfy given requirements for quality. So who owns this? Who owns quality assurance? It's the agency, right? We're the owner. Um, so planned and systematic actions that will satisfy given requirements. So in other words, are we getting what we paid for? So quality control, on the other hand, would be contractor operational techniques and activities that are performed to fulfill the contract requirements. So who owns this? Who owns quality control? Right? Be the contractor or the vendor. Um, so operational techniques to fulfill the contract requirements. In other words, am I getting what I intended to do? Am I doing what I think I'm doing? Kind of the third leg of this three-legged stool that often gets forgotten is independent assurance. Um, that's also spelled out in the CFR. And that's activities that are an unbiased and independent evaluation of all the sampling and testing procedures used in the acceptance program. So who owns independent assurance? Be the agency. Now, independent assurance is not, it doesn't have anything to do with quality assurance tests, penalties, payments, nothing to do with that. Independent assurance is, is simply making sure that what we're doing, what the contractor's doing, we're all doing the same thing. In other words, we're using the same yardstick, using the same ruler. So who owns quality? So if you think about a chip seal job, we've got our aggregate supplier, got our emulsion suppliers, and they may have their own quality requirements, but somehow these materials end up at the job site and then somehow they get put down on the road, so it gets constructed. So up to this point, who owns the quality? Be the contractor, right? Because he's doing quality control. He's ensuring that he's doing what he intends to do at that point. So what's the agency's role up to this point? 
overseeing. We're making sure that, that the uh, materials, the applications, everything are, are uh, per the specifications. So we're performing quality assurance. So then once that job gets constructed, gets completed, at some point the agency's gonna accept it, final the contract, payments made. So at that point we own it, right? We own the, the job, we own the quality. So we have to ensure that it was constructed and built to our requirements up until that point because we're gonna own it at that point. So what do we QA? I mean, what do we, what do, we do quality assurance on? I mean, the materials, right? So obviously the aggregate and the emulsion so if I have good aggregate and good emulsion, I'm going to have a good chip seal job, right? Probably not. Application rates are critical. Um, Dave did a great job talking about uh, mixed designs for microsurface. It's no different for chip seals. Uh, application rate, shot rate, pretty much is what our mixed design is for a chip seal. So uh, mixed designs are critical. And he referenced the uh, emulsion task force, and that's correct. So I think we've worked on... Four, I think we've done chip seal, microsurface, fog seal, and I think tack coat may be in the pipe. Jason, does that sound right? Okay. So every one of those specs, there's three components to it. There's a material spec, there's a construction guide and best practice, but there's also a, a design guide. Um, that's a requirement. So that's how critical application rates are. So this just happens to be our chip seal design software, but I put in all my inputs and it spits out a six, right? So there, I'm done. I get good quality, right? No. I got to make sure that I'm actually putting that number down. So I got to get that through equipment calibration. This is a very critical component of anything. If I'm doing a microsurface mix design, you know, everything's based on that thing batching it right in the truck. Chip seal is the same way. That chip spreader, depending on the aggregate, the source, the gradation, it's going to put out different amount of material. So it's got to be calibrated specific to each job. Um, what about the final product? Okay, does anybody have a good way to do quality assurance or quality control on the final product, not just the ingredients and the application? If you are, I'd be real curious to know what that is. Um, one of the things that I did learn this week, uh, Michigan State's actually working on a method to do just this for chip seals, where they're coming up with a way to take a core and then through digital imaging and some cube computer post-processing, it'll actually tell you what the aggregate embedment was and what the application rates were. So really, if we can get to this, all the stuff before it kind of goes away, because do we care? If we get a good final product, do we really care how we got there? Um, so quality control plans. Um, Tracy, I think, is going to go into probably a lot more details here, but I'm just going to kind of touch over. Uh, so each material supplier would have their own quality control plan. Uh, the aggregate suppliers, I know most states have approved suppliers. Emulsion suppliers, they might be certified or approved, but they're going to have their own quality control plans. Following it's key. So, you know, you can have the best quality control plan in the world. If nobody's reading it, nobody's following it, it doesn't mean anything. So the contractor also should have a quality control plan. So I'm going to, I'm going to go out and do a chip seal in this case, but it's got to be specific to each job. So it can't be the same quality control plan recycled. It's going to be different materials, different people, maybe different equipment, depending on the job. Uh, agency may have guidelines for quality control plans. I know we do, whether it's hot mix asphalt, concrete, uh, microsurface chip seal. We have specific guidelines on what we need to see in a quality control plan. Um, some of those things may be we need to define who the QC personnel would be, and these are probably going to change, at least the technician, by job. Um, process balance and equipment utilized on the job. Uh, anyone's ever been on a chip seal job where you roll up and there's eight trucks there lined up to get in the hopper? Those eight trucks, you know, we go five, six miles down the road, and then we sit and wait an hour because we don't have enough trucks out. They've, they've got to drive an hour now to get to the quarry and get back, and so the rest of the time we're just sitting there. That's, that's not a good way to run a job. We want to keep the chip box moving. Uh, what equipment utilized on the job? Uh, some of you guys might have been through Tom Wood's uh, chip seal training over the past. You know, Tom, formerly with Minnesota DOT, he would always tell the story about how their spec called for uh, three rollers on the job. And the third roller sometimes would get towed out because it didn't actually have a motor, but it was on the job. <laughs> so <laughs> equipment calibration procedure, remember, we got, we got to have if, you know, that application rate, we've got to make sure that we're actually getting that on the road. Um, construction sequence, so every job's going to be a little bit different. Control of application rates, how am I going to ensure that I'm getting that on the road? So 
just a little thing that we've come up with. Uh, if you're familiar with a wet film thickness gauge, it's actually for measuring paint, but someone pointed out, I think it was my boss, that you know, spraying emulsion on the road is really no different than paint. So by using a little piece of sign panel, you spray your emulsion over it, and then you measure the wet film thickness, and it's pretty easy to back calculate what the actual application rate was. So it's just a super quick check as we're going down the road to make sure we're actually getting the right application rate. Procedure for, uh, yeah, procedure for sweeping, schedule for sweeping, and then traffic control. Um, for a chip seal or a microsurface, these are real critical. Anything that's got cure involved before we can put traffic on it, we've got to know what's our plan going in to getting traffic back on it. Um, one of our districts, which I think has a good plan, they close roads when they chip seal. So they'll go in and close the road first thing in the morning, they'll chip seal the road, they have a crew come in at night, actually sweeps the road overnight, and then that crew will take the barricades down. So the next morning the road is open, it's cured, it's ready. We're also working on, if anyone uh, was in the Midwest meeting Tuesday morning, Indiana's working on a, uh, a uh, it's actually a resistivity meter. It was developed for the concrete pavement industry to uh, check curing of concrete. And someone made the connection that it's kind of the same in asphalt emulsion. So we're trying to calibrate and, and correlate that meter to actually tell us when the emulsion is cured enough to hold on to the chip that we can open it to traffic. Uh, we can't always close roads, unfortunately. Uh, any other special consideration, you know, intersections, if you're going through a high volume area, through a town, a curbed area, there's always other things that we've got to do. Uh, material sampling and testing in response to the results. So what am I going to do? It, it's real easy if you're going down and all your tests are, are right down the middle, but when you get one that's out of spec, what do you do? What's your response? Um, and then documentation. You know, how long do I hold on to those records? John's going to talk a lot about conflict resolution, um, partnering. So those are things we need to know up front. All right, so I'm going to do a quiz now. Try to wake everybody up and... Uh, see how much we know about quality assurance. So let's, let's look at this scenario. Agency inspector takes a random sample to check gradation. This would be an example of what? Quality assurance, right? Yeah. Am I getting what I paid for? How about the contractor performs a yield calculation to ensure his application rate is correct? What's that an example of? Quality control, yep. He's making sure he's doing what he intends to do. Here's a hard one. Get a situation. You fla the flagger at the end of the job notes excessive aggregate pickup on passing vehicles. Looks like this. This was one of the worst days of my career. <laughs> so what's the contractor's response? Ask for a QA test. Something's wrong with that emulsion. Increase the aggregate application rate. That is the response to any problem with the chip seal is just bump the rock up. <laughs> or stop operations, stabilize, assess the situation for the QC plan. Yeah, don't make a bad situation worse. I know it's, for the contractors in the room, I mean, you've, you're, you're out there, all that equipment, all that labor, you know, you got, you got miles to go. It's real hard to stop all that, but just think about what you're potentially uh, causing in damage versus what it's going to keep to keep going. And yeah, stop and assess. Now, the QC plan is certainly not going to address every single potentiality that could happen, but it's got to it's have enough detail in it to where if something's going wrong, what do I do? And that should be, if it's really bad, stop and assess. Remember the goal. We want to get a quality product. That's good for all of us. It's good for the motoring public. It's good for the taxpayers. It's good for the agency. It's good for the contractor. So how do we get there? How do we get that quality product on the road? Good specifications. Yeah, I think we're working that direction. I think we're getting some good specifications. Good designs. Yeah, I think we can get good designs. We know, kind of know what we're doing now as far as application rates. But qualified personnel. You know, you got to have the, the person actually putting the, the, the treatment down has got to know what he's doing, and whoever's overseeing the job has got to know what they're looking at. Um, the session before lunch, a lot of you folks were probably there on the certification. I think we've come a long way uh, certification, and hopefully that will get us over the hump. Um, I can tell you, I don't have any pictures of this because it just happened a few weeks ago, but we had a chip seal contract. It was in one of our prisons, fortunately. It was on a perimeter road where the contractor shot the emulsion, parked the distributor, 
The distributor operator got in the dump truck because he's now the haul truck operator, goes to the quarry to get rock. In the meantime, it rains, comes back, and they actually put the rock on the road. Now, how do you think that chip seal turned out? What's really bad is whoever was overseeing that obviously had no idea what they were looking at. They didn't read the specs. They had no idea what a chip seal was even supposed to be. So not good. Any questions? Quiet group. The lovers of quality are an introverted. I think so. They are. They are a very quiet group. Or it's just all that chicken they had for lunch. Yeah, and that's one of the challenges there. Thank, thank Tom.